A week after the fall of Da Nang, the war came to Saigon. A South Vietnamese pilot defected. He abandoned his mission in midair and bombed the presidential palace. And about an hour after the bombing of the palace came the imposition of a 24 hour curfew. It was announced on Vietnamese radio and on loudspeakers very noisily in the streets in the center of Saigon itself. When the announcement came, people poured out of the shops, the offices, the businesses in the center, and they're now jamming the streets on their way home. It's absolute bedlam. Washington wanted to know the mood of the city, but official embassy reports only gave the good news. I got a phone call at my villa one night from State Department. They said, look, we don't trust the reporting coming out. Would you please send us separately a telegram describing what you see as the psychological atmosphere there on the ground, in the embassy and out on the streets? And I said, I'll do it. Uh, I'll file it through my USIA channel. I said, but 24 hours, Graham will have read it, and that'll be the last one you're going to get out of me, only because he will have stopped me. We need that. So I filed it. Uh, the last line, as I recall it, of the cable was indicative of all that preceded it in the cable. There is fear out there bordering on panic. Out in the country, the North Vietnamese advance and continued to within 30 miles of Saigon. Thousands of refugees came flooding into the city. They brought with them tales of atrocities committed by bloodthirsty communists. The rumors at that time was, okay, they, they are coming in, in and they rape, and I heard that there's, there's where rape happen, that they would pull out the fingernails of women that who have their nail paint, uh, painted, and, uh, and that they uh, would execute people that who work for the Americans. In spite of the rumors, Kim stayed at her post. She had absolute faith in the Americans. I am surrounded by my American friend who keeps saying to me that we would never leave you and the U.S. government would never leave you. We will stay here with you until the end. They believe that Saigon would not fall and if it falls, it would be a long time. But no one ever discussed like the possibility that the, the American would drop us. I think they're afraid to bring it up to us too because there was fear that they would cause chaos in their company. People would flee them. Uh, all of these, um, of course, they may be, I didn't know then, but maybe they was under the pressure not to say anything that would cause panic because they was constantly assuring us, you will leave with us if it happened. But the fall of Saigon won't happen so quickly. The Americans were more the events at Da Nang. If the same panic engulfed Saigon, it would be many times worse. Publicly, the embassy encouraged the view that no Vietnamese need leave Saigon. One of the principal things that we had to do was to avoid doing anything that might create a panic and therefore make it impossible for us to go ahead with evacuating either Americans or, for that matter, Vietnamese. So the governing principle was, yes, do things in time, but do not do them too quickly, not too soon. But many Americans and some Vietnamese with money or the right connections were now leaving the city on commercial flights. Sensing the Americans might abandon them, fear began to take hold of the streets of Saigon. I would get back to my villa late at night or whenever, and there would be 
15, 20, 25 people outside the gate. They come in and, you know, you're the minister for this and, and our, we've been loyal to the U.S., uh, we're in sensitive positions, please get me and my family out. And you would say, we can't. And uh, they would fall sometimes to their knees. And, and when I use the word grovel, I mean, that's what they did. And they would say, never mind me, get my wife, my children, my mother, my father out, please. I think it's the worst thing emotionally that I've ever encountered as an adult dealing with other adults who thought you were some kind of a power bastion that could save them from one of their worst fears. They saw us as what we were, the power. They knew we were the power behind whatever government was uh, then in office, uh, and the next one and the one after that. They knew that we were the financial uh, providers, if you will, of the economy, uh, and they knew we were powerful. I, I can think of no other episode during what was, for me, the worst nine months of my government career, for a lot of reasons, not, the, not just the eventual outcome. I can think of nothing that hit me with the wallop that that did. Pressure was growing from Washington to begin an evacuation. A North Vietnamese victory was now looking inevitable, and they wanted all Americans out of Saigon. But Martin was still resisting an evacuation. He cabled the White House, warning them that angry South Vietnamese would turn on the Americans for abandoning them. One thing that would set off violence would be a sudden order for an American evacuation. Of one thing I am certain, deadly certain, if U.S. armed forces come in here, they will be fighting the South Vietnamese on the way out. But Martin may have had personal reasons for staying. To leave would be to admit defeat to the communists, something he could never accept. There was a son who had been killed during the war in Vietnam. It was a very psychological element, and until presque au dernier moment, il a, il, il a cru que la situation pouvait se renverser que, euh, le, et que les choses pouvaient continuer et que finalement euh, le, euh, la politique américaine au Vietnam serait un succès. In Saigon, the word on the street was that a communist assault on the city was not far off. The disintegrating South Vietnamese army shored up Saigon's defenses in a desperate attempt to save the city. I have a little bicycle and I get on the bicycle and just ride down the city and uh, just experience the panic uh, of people, you know, running around. Fear and panic are swift moving emotions. People panicked quickly in other cities like Hue, Da Nang and Nha Trang. They could panic quickly here if they sensed the North Vietnamese were moving in on Saigon. The difference is, this time, that from Saigon, there is no place left to run. Basically, I, I cannot think of any way to leave Vietnam, you know. Uh, I was 16 and always been sheltered my whole life. My family been taking care of me all this time. And boom, right now they cannot do anything and I feel powerless. C'était une situation très, très angoissante parce que Saigon était menacé de deux événements qui pouvaient être tragiques. D'une part, une anarchie complète avec des bandes de pillards euh, euh, qui auraient... Euh, Nordistes 
euh, auraient été obligés de les, de les bombarder. Et Saïgon est une ville fragile. Et en plus de ça, physiquement, c'est une ville qui grouillait d'enfants. Ça m'avait frappé. Vous voyez des, des enfants partout, n'est-ce pas Parce que c'est le climat, les, les enfants qui, qui jouaient dans la rue. Alors, l'idée qu'il y aurait dans cette ville surpeuplée qui aurait des combats était une idée à faire frémir. Hein.